Oh, come to order. Come to order. Oh, thank you, Judge. How are you doing? All right. We are the College of Complexes, and uh, what are we doing to here tonight? We're hearing from Andrew Johnson Nelson. Andrew Nelson, uh, who is candidate for mayor of Chicago, and uh, he's going to tell us who are the principles of uh, the Chicago Parking LLC and uh, something about the merits and effects of uh, Eugene Jark's uh, Shackman case on hiring and firing of city workers and uh, Linda Acor's expose of the death of the justice system. Uh, I think she wrote a book by that title. But we'll hear it all from uh, Mr. Nelson, who has spoken to us before and is ready to address us uh, shortly. Uh, let's see. You know the rules, one fool at a time, and we don't insult anybody personally too bad. Uh, or their parents. Uh, we're not going to be sexist. Um, what about... Uh, Why can't we just leave it at no personal attack? That's good, the tradition. Good. You have no authority to add on to it. How about that? <laughs> okay. We've heard from Mo Shanto before, but now we're going to hear from Andrew Nelson, candidate for mayor. The Lazarus is spelled L-A-Z-A-R-I-S. <coughs> I'm Andrew Nelson, candidate for mayor of the city of Chicago. My political mentor, Bill Dot Walls, is the primary protege of Chicago's first black mayor, Harold Washington. I am largely informed by the statement issued by the Universal House of Justice on uh, 26 November 1992, which uh, reads as follows. <coughs> A full century has gone by since the covenant of Baha'u'llah was established and set in motion. And we, the, oh, we extend, I'm trying to sound like former Universal House of Justice Chairman Dr. David S. Rule. That's why I mentioned Lazarus. Maybe I'll just scrap this and talk about something else. After all, I am running for mayor of Chicago. And uh, I think it's probably, oh, well, thank you very much. Maybe I will actually read the statement of the House of Justice. You know, call me in a second by mm -hmm. Congress because, well, it, it, it'll be self-evident when we hear it. <clears throat> I wax um, nostalgic on this like Jesse Jackson waxes nostalgic on Dr. King by the Dream Speech of the Israel. A full century has gone by since the covenant of Baha'u'llah was established and set in motion. And we extend to the members of his community our loving greetings as they are assembled today at the World Congress in New York and auxiliary conferences on all continents, or as they otherwise participate in the observance of this centennial occasion. We are particularly pleased that we have been afforded a special opportunity to pause for a moment, together with our fellow believers, to gather our thoughts, to see how we have fared since 1892, and to consider where we are now headed. This enables us to engage in a symbolic act, which by its very nature exemplifies the purpose of the covenant, a covenant intended by its divine author, unite the races and nations of the earth. Sublime emotions surge in our hearts 
As we survey the dramatic history and amazing progress of these 100 years, at the time of the passing of Baha'u'llah, the Baha'i community was contained within the borders of no more than 15 countries, the vast majority of its members living in its native Iran. The community now embraces the entire planet. We rejoice that the spirit of unity, which is evident in its steady consolidation, the workings of the administrative order to which the covenant is given birth. Our accumulated experience has clearly demonstrated the efficacy of the covenant. The genuine unity it induces greatly encourages our expectation that all of humanity can and will be united. We have toiled to build a community at a period when the world has witnessed startling changes which have profoundly altered the character of society and plunged it into an unprecedented state of worry and confusion. Indeed, the world in its current condition has lost its bearings, the operation of forces it neither understands nor can control. It is a period in which great dynasties and empires have collapsed in rapid succession, which powerful ideologies have captured the hearts of millions, only to expire in infamy, in which two world wars wreaked havoc on civilized life, as it was known at the beginning of the 20th century. In the wake of such horrendous disruptions, there have been, example, there have been unexampled advances in the realms of science, technology, and social organization, a veritable explosion of knowledge, and even more remarkable burgeoning in the awakening and rise of masses of humanity which were previously presumed to be dormant. These masses are claiming their rightful places within the community of nations, which has greatly expanded. With the simultaneous development of communications at the speed of light and transportation at the speed of sound, the world is contracted into a mere neighborhood in which people are instantly aware of each other's affairs and have immediate access to each other. And yet, even with such miraculous advances, with the emergence of international organizations and with valiant attempts and brilliant successes at international cooperation, nations are at woeful odds with one another. People are convulsed by economic upheavals. Races feel more alienated than before and are filled with mistrust, humiliation, and fear. Collateral with these changes has been the breakdown of institutions, religious and political, which traditionally function as the guideposts for the stability of society. Even the most resilient of these seem to be losing their credibility as they have become preoccupied with their own internal disorder. This calls attention to the emptiness of the moral landscape and the feeling of utility deranging personal life. Thoughtful commentators write apprehensively about the fall of culture and the consequent disappearance of values, the loss of the fullness of the inner life a technological civilization facing an increasingly serious crisis. They write, moreover, of the human species as being at the end with its wisdom and being unable to control itself, of the need for divine wisdom and foresight, and of the human psyche as being far removed from recognizing this need. These ominous comments reflect the universal consequences of a failed understanding as to the purpose of God for humankind is in this particular respect the revelation of Baha'u'llah sheds new light. It refreshes our thoughts. It clarifies and expands our conceptions. His teachings imbue us with the abundance of God's love for his creatures. They impress upon us the indispensability of justice in human relations and emphasize the importance of adhering to principle in all matters. They inform us that the human being that human beings have been created to carry forward an ever-advancing civilization, and that the virtues that befit the dignity of every person are forbearance, 
mercy, compassion, and loving kindness towards all the peoples and kindreds of the earth. As the members of our community have pursued their plan for teaching its faith, they have grown to appreciate more adequately the purpose of the multifarious processes of change which have been at work during the course of the century. Such simultaneous processes of rise and fall, of integration and disintegration, of order and chaos, with their continuous and reciprocal reactions on each other, are, our teachings tell us, but aspects of a greater plan, one and indivisible, whose source is God, whose author is Baha'u'llah, the theater of whose operations is the entire planet, and whose ultimate objectives are the unity of the human race and the peace of all mankind. This unity is the crux of the problems which so severely afflict the planet. It permeates attitudes in all departments of life. It's at the heart of all major conflicts between nations and peoples. More serious still, this unity is common in the relations between religions and within religions, vitiating the very spiritual and moral influence which it is their primary purpose to exert. Should the lamp of religion be obscured by Allah's source, chaos and confusion will ensue, and the lights of fairness, of justice, of tranquility and peace cease to shine. In elaboration of these dreadful consequences, our teachings state that when, as a result of human diversity, the light of religion is quenched in men's hearts, a deplorable decline in the fortunes of humanity immediately sets in, bringing in its wake all the evils which a wayward soul is capable of revealing. The perversion of human nature, the degradation of human conduct, the corruption and dissolution of human institutions reveal themselves under such circumstances in their worst and most revolting aspect. Human character is debased, confidence is shaken, the nerves of discipline are relaxed, the voice of human conscience is still, the sense of decency and shame is obscured, conceptions of duty, of solidarity, of reciprocity and loyalty are distorted, and the very feeling of peacefulness, of joy, and of hope is gradually extinguished. Such, unfortunately, is the state to which institutions and individuals have come in our time. Against this background, the, concept, the requirements of the covenant assume even more critical importance than before. There can be no doubt that if our community is to cope with the situation, it must rapidly advance towards the next phase in its evolution. It will be a phase in which the faith of Baha'u'llah must of necessity anticipate a deep encounter with the forces operating with such bewildering ferocity throughout the world. Let us therefore take this propitious occasion to review the covenantal arrangement which generates and sustains our actions. The foundation of our belief rests on our recognition of the sovereignty of God, the unknowable essence, the supreme creator, and on our submission to his will as revealed for this age by Baha'u'llah, to accept the messenger of God in his day and to abide by his bidding are the two essential and inseparable duties which each soul was created to fulfill. One exercises these twin duties by one's own choice, and by so doing, performs an act which may be regarded as the highest expression of free will, with which every human being is endowed by an all-living creator. The vehicle in this resplendent age for the practical fulfillment of these duties is the covenant of Baha'u'llah. It is the instrument by which belief in him is translated into constructive deeds. The oneness of humankind is the pivotal principle and ultimate goal of his mission. This principle means far more than the reawakening of the spirit of brotherhood and goodwill among people. It implies an organic change in the structure of present day society, a change such as the world has not yet experienced. The covenant of Baha'u'llah embodies the spirit, instrumentality, and method to attain this essential goal. In addition to laying down in his book of laws the fundamentals for a new world order, 
Baha'u'llah in the Book of His Covenant confirmed the appointment of his son, Abdul Baha, as the interpreter of his word and the center of his covenant. As the interpreter, Abdul Baha became the living mouth of the book, the expounder of the word. As the center of the covenant, he became the incorruptible medium for applying the word to practical measures for the raising up of a new civilization. The covenant is, therefore, unique as a divine phenomenon in that Baha'u'llah, further to conferring upon Abdul Baha the necessary authority to fulfill the requirements of his singular office, vested in him the virtues of perfection in personal and social behavior that humanity may have an enduring model to emulate. In no annals of the past has been reported such an arrangement for ensuring the realization of the purpose of the manifestation of God. This covenant is a guarantee against schism. That is why those who occasionally attempt to create a cleavage in the community utterly fail in the long run. Similarly, the, the incessant persecution the community has been forced to endure for more than a century in the land of Baha'u'llah's birth has not succeeded in destroying its identity or undermining its organic unity. The glorious ultimate effect of this arrangement will be to ensure the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. As promised in the holy books of old, and as proclaimed by Baha'u'llah himself. The day of the promise has come, he clearly announces. And he who is the promised one, loudly proclaimeth before all who are in heaven and all who are on earth. Verily, there is none other God but he, the help in peril, the self-subsisting. I swear by God, that which had been enshrined from eternity in the knowledge of God, the knower of the seen and unseen, is revealed. Happy is the eye that seeth, and the face that turneth towards the countenance of God, the Lord of all beings. Indeed, the coming of Baha'u'llah ushered the world into a new age, making possible the beginning of a wholly new relationship between humanity and the Supreme Creator. The characteristics of this relationship are summed up in the covenant inaugurated upon his passing a century ago. Its spiritual dynamic and cohesive power, its unifying principles and practical institutional provisions are a pattern for the healing of the ills afflicting our fractured societies and defective social systems. The covenant of Baha'u'llah gives new meaning to humanity's checkered history. Yeah. It imparts a fresh impulse to human striving. Like unto the artery, Abdul Baha states, it beats and pulsates in the body of the world. The pervasive influence it exerts is at the heart of the derangement of human affairs. It drives the accelerating transition from the old order to the new world order envisaged by Baha'u'llah. Soon, he writes, will the present day order be rolled up and a new one spread out in its stead. And he explains, the world's equilibrium has been upset. The vibrating influence of this most great, this new world order. Mankind's ordered life has been revolutionized through the agency of this unique, this wondrous system, the like of which mortal eyes have never witnessed. Let those seriously concerned about the state and fate of the world give due attention to the claims of Baha'u'llah. Let them realize that the storms battering at the foundations of society will not be stilled unless and until spiritual principles are actively engaged in the search for solutions to social problems. Let us, the followers of Baha'u'llah, Redouble our effort in the exercise of our sacred duty to acquaint all humanity with the animating purpose of the worldwide law of Baha'u'llah. Let them discover that, far from aiming at the subversion of the existing foundations of society, it seeks to broaden its basis, to remold its institutions in a manner constant with the needs of an ever-changing world. Let us, with patience and humility, respond to challenging or skeptical questions while unfolding the purposes of this law. 
let them know that it can conflict with no legitimate allegiances, nor can it undermine essential loyalties. Its purpose is neither to stifle the flame of a sane and intelligent patriotism in men's hearts, nor to abolish the system of national autonomy. So essential if the evils of excessive centralization are to be avoided. Let us, by word and example, show that it does not ignore, nor does it attempt to suppress, the diversity of ethnical origins, of climate, of history, of language and tradition, of thought and habit that differentiate the peoples and nations of the world. Finally, let them appreciate that it calls for wider loyalty, for a larger aspiration than any that has animated the human race, that it insists upon the subordination of national impulses and interests to the imperative claims of a unified world, that it repudiates excessive centralization on the one hand and disclaims all attempts at uniformity on the other, that its watchword is unity in diversity. Its watchword is unity in diversity. It is especially noteworthy that, coincidental with this Baha'i Holy Year, are the commemorations of other world-shaking occurrences, which, centuries ago, commenced processes destined to attain their glorious consummation in the promised day of God. The ultimate resolution of the profound issues to which they gave rise, and which have ripened with the passage of time, is discernible in the eventual realization of the world-embracing system of Baha'u'llah. Our thoughts turn to the history of Abdul Baha's epic journey to the West in 1912, and particularly to North America, where, in New York, the city of the covenant, he disclosed to his Western disciples the implications of the covenant of Baha'u'llah. It was, in a sense, an act of renewal. Perspective of the uh, consolidation of the union of the old and new worlds into one global entity. Surnamed by him, City of the Covenant, New York resonates with the effects of that experience of then, it was 80 years ago, but now it's 101 years ago, 1912. Uh, then it was the, it was still the major entryway to the land of promise for millions of people seeking new horizons. Now it is recognized as a gathering place for the leaders of nations, an international venue for efforts at achieving unity in the political realm. Its very atmosphere vibrates with the hopes of a world seeking to set its affairs in order. Today the hearts of the Baha'is throughout the earth are focused on the City of the Covenant, wherein many thousands of their fellow believers from all parts of the planet have assembled in the Second Baha'i World Congress. The presence there of such a widely varied representation of the human race is an affirmation of the unique power of the Covenant, which the event was convened to celebrate. In this season of beginnings and of the commemoration of beginnings, we Baha'is set for ourselves a new measure of effort, one more daring and persistent than before. May our words proclaim and our deeds demonstrate that there is only one God, only one religion, only one race. And few though we be, may we thus fulfill our duty towards Baha'u'llah, towards his covenant, and indeed towards all humankind. self-evident to anyone that has any proficiency in the English language. Um, are there any questions as to um, my uh, candidacy for mayor of Chicago? We'd like to hear about your candidacy, not about your Baha'i faith. Why don't you go ahead and give us your basic tech platform and what you're planning on running on? Well, um, I'm informed by, as I mentioned earlier, by what I just read. And um, uh, Andy mentioned the prison industrial complex. I'm very keen about dealing with uh, the inordinate incarceration of individuals uh, 
wrongfully convicted. We need to establish the precedent and really enforce the precedent of holding accountable law enforcement that knowingly wrongfully convict and uh, incarcerate individuals and allow them to go to death row and even be executed, knowing that there is an overwhelming preponderance of exculpatory evidence and potential testimony that would clearly uh, you know, show the innocence of the individual who was wrongly convicted. Um, so I know that uh, there's a group called the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC. That group has been around for about 40 years. I was watching Bill Moyers and I learned about that recently. And that's the group that um, wines and dines members of Congress, perhaps most notably uh, Senate uh, Judiciary Chairman uh, from Utah, what's his name? Uh, he, uh, along with state legislators all over the country, um, but, uh, you know, um, as a practical matter, you know, uh, I, I'm not officially a member of the Baha'i Faith, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm with the program. <laughs> um, you know, I, um, uh, you know, if my name is on the ballot, then it, it should be clear who the votes were between me and Rami Emanuel. Um, so I make myself available and accessible for people to, uh, to talk to me and I give everyone my business card, my personal information on it. Um, are there any questions, uh, comments? No. If, if you became mayor of Chicago, what are the, uh, what's the two things you would tackle first? The first thing is to adjudicate Eugene Zorg Shackman case. That has implications. It, the death of the justice system, this book, is the number one bestseller on the U.S. Bureau of Prisons because they know the power of this book. Here's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, I have, I have more copies. Sorry. And um, that's. Job number one, and uh, finance chairman Ed Burke knows it, you know, and uh, that's job number one. So that will result in so very much in dealing with the uh, injustice inherent in our criminal justice system, and uh, uh, that in and of itself will, um, if it's done properly, and I'm confident that it will be done in a very effective way. Um, politicians need to be held accountable and they need to answer legitimate questions that people have, you know? And uh, so many politicians, you know, in this country, um, people seem to be afraid of the politicians when they should be frightened to death of us, quite frankly, for not doing right by us, you know? So, I'm making the point to do right by everyone so that everybody, you know, be on board pretty much. You know? Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, are, are you related to Dennis Nelson, the man that was supposed to speak to last Saturday? I don't believe I know Dennis, Dennis Nelson. Is he a okay. black guy? Yes, he is white. But, <laughs> a white guy? No, yes, he is white. Okay, white guy. But, but okay. you know, I have black relatives, so that is... I probably not relate to him. My um, paternal grandfather was Duncan Wesley Nelson from uh -huh. uh, Lynchburg, South Carolina. He moved over to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm his youngest grandson. He was born in maybe 1874. My father, Andrew Duncan Douglas Nelson, was born in 1895. He was... Uh -huh. uh, World War One veteran served over in France, and I'm a nephew and grandson of many Methodist ministers. Wow. Yes. Now you're you're talking about running against Rahm Emanuel for mayor. Right. Now the city of Chicago is well over eight million plus people. Mm -hmm. You have a multi-million dollar million. budget. Right. You have many many concerns from constituencies mm -hmm. give us a summary of your executive ability and how you'd appoint a staff to take care of all of these problems in the city well, as well I, as the I know that Bill Doc Walls would certainly help me with this he uh, knows the inner workings of Chicago city government better than I do he would probably be my chief of staff my um, right-hand man 
And with Bill Doc Wald working with me, I'm confident that we will resolve all of the issues that, uh, that you mentioned there. Yeah. Um, I don't know who the heck you are. Can you give me the last a summary of the last 10 years of your life? What have you been doing? Well, those who do the most good say the least about it. So you I was went on prison the, last I, year? No. <laughs> I was on the Man Cow Muller show you recently. Were? Oh, yeah. Really? You guys know Man Cow Muller? Yeah. No. Yeah, great. No. Oh, my God. Yeah. I and uh, I'm trying to remember what I was going to say uh, because it kind of relates to your question. He said, well, how come we've never heard of you, Mr. Andrew Nelson? I said that, you know, people that are doing words to the effect that said something like, uh, people that are doing the greatest work, we're just obscure, and then we appear and, and make our um, presentation at the right time. And some of the most profound people in the world, uh, Shogi Effende, for example. Uh, you know, most people don't know who Shogi Effende was, right? And um, sometimes the most profound people in the world are just obscure, they just quietly do their work, and and um, so generation of subsequent so people, question. people surmise so, so you're not who they were. And, and if I were to vote for you, I'd basically be both be uh, picking a pig and a poke, right? I don't know who the heck you are. Well, you know, and you won't tell me. For a <laughs> yeah, that's Jan Jan I, I ran for Congress in 1986 in Illinois' first congressional district as a Republican. That's one fact. I'll give you nine more. My major platform plank was prison reform. This was right before the beginning of the privatization of prisons throughout the country. So, uh, yeah. What would you do about the, uh, the crime problem in neighborhoods like Inglewood and Little Village? Well, I would um, probably um, want uh, Christopher Cooper to be my police superintendent. And um, I would give him instructions as to, um, you know, how to, how the officers are to interact with the people. I like the idea of um, more policemen uh, living in Chicago, maybe even in the neighborhood itself, so they become an integral part of uh, Englewood and Little Village, as you mentioned. Um, one of the things I would do is generate revenue by uh, levying a uh, financial transaction tax against uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Chicago Board Options Exchange, and put that in a separate um, bank accounts, uh, separate and apart from the general revenue fund. And that money would be used to pay property taxes for Chicago public school teachers and public safety people throughout the state. What would you do then if the Mercantile decides to move out of the city? Well, <laughs> The fact is, they're still here, and um, you know, um, they were given all kinds of tax incentives to be here, and there has to be some legal way to make them, um, you know, pay back the taxes that they were given because it's they would have some nerve to move out of the city after being given all these tax breaks to, um, to establish themselves on the South Street. So give us some numbers. So how many actual signatures do you need on the Probably 25,000. Probably 25,000. Okay, and then what, what do you think uh, amount of uh, campaign funds can we get actually want the campaign? There's a advertising or message out. Maybe a million dollars? I don't know. I, um, there was some uh, U.S. Senator, I think, William Proxmire, that ran the campaign on very little money, I think it was. So. Is from Wisconsin, is it Proxmire or someone else? <laughs> well, uh, they've traveled. Uh, in view of the fact that we have these um, speed cameras that are being put in, and uh, where they can fine you uh, $100 for going a few miles over the limit, and uh, photo enforcement cameras where they grab you for a hundred bucks every chance they get. Well, first I need to, okay. And um, now they've got another thing they want to uh, be able to uh, 
uh, hit you with a, something like a hundred or five hundred dollar fine and confiscate your car. But first, uh, if you let so much as they throw are, a gum the wrapper, of, of the company. if you so much as throw a gum wrapper out of the out of your window, I mean, the, the my decision, question is, yeah. what will you do about that kind of thing? Well, I think that executive leadership sets a tone, and. Um, the tone has a way of um, becoming tacitly understood by um, people in whatever departments they're in, pretty much. Um, I want to identify who the principals of these LLCs and other corporate entities are. And um, I'm also a journalist, uh, I'm an investigative reporter. It's uh, a vocation of mine, something I do whether I'm paid for it or not. <coughs> and I would use my journalistic talents in, um, you know, um, collaboration with other journalists who are maybe somewhat um, uh, independent and not beholden to the corporate media, um, to actually report um, the names of who's doing what and investigate these people and make sure that they are um, contributing uh, members of uh, Chicago society. Make it known they are needing more data. Let's go to Chanko. What would be your plan to do something about the parking mess? Uh, the parking mess? You mean the, the parking meters or high price? The parking meters. Oh, the high price and the um, 75 or 99 year lease at LAZ parking. Uh, well. Uh, there are ways to, um, you know, humanity is not to be crucified for the, um, uh, uh, for, um, I'm trying to get the exact words right, uh, to maintain any particular law or doctrine. Any law or, doc law or doctrine can be overridden uh, for the preservation of any particular law or doctrine. Any, any law or doctrine that ill affects people, if enough people are ill affected by it, with the will of the people being the law of the land, it has a way of this being overturned on the strength of the will of the people determining that um, that law or doctrine is no longer beneficial. How come this All uh, right, uh, Wayne Servant has the next um, question. Yeah, you can't be on the record. Yeah. Well, I, I call it the Bronzeville Times. The Bronzeville Times. It's to be a video podcasting service working out of the old Chicago Defender building in 34th, Indiana. But it hasn't happened as of yet. And what it would do is turn anyone into a citizen journalist that we would be the clearinghouse for them sending their information, whether it's video footage or pictures or reports, to um, various media outlets. And then we're paying us for that, and then we're giving the journalist who provides the information at least 50% of whatever money is uh, generated. I've, I've not published anything yet, but I intend to very soon. I haven't worked for any um, medium at all, or any media service at all. I'm on, on again, off again, member of the National Association of Black Journalists Chicago chapter. Um, but other than that, I've not really done any official journalism publishing at all, really. And that's the truth. I have to be truthful. But I'm, I'm bent on getting the, 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 uh, the vital information out and having that as a public service. Uh, Wilson Anderson. Uh, are you uh, the Association of Black Journalists you mentioned? Yeah, National Association of Black Journalists Chicago chapter. I'm an on again, off again member of them. Do they are they affiliated at all with uh, Project Censored out of Sonoma State University? I I have no idea really. Um, uh, I haven't been to any BJ Chicago chapter meeting about two or three years. Where do they meet? <sighs> they meet at various places. Sometimes they meet at um, Chicago Tribune Tower. In the sub basement, sometimes they've met at um, Columbia College in various places throughout the city. Uh, NBC Five. All right. 
Charles? Do you have a question, Robert? No. All right. Charles? Yeah, Mr. Nelson, are you going to see to it that a lot of speed cameras and red light cameras are put up so that pedestrians as myself and children and old people can cross streets safely? Shogi Effendi was very thorough. And in order to give an informed answer, I have to ascertain where the money is going and who's making money from, from that. And then I'll be in a better position to, to deal with the situation when I know who's waxing rich from uh, you know, inconvenience. This is for my personal safety and safety of children and old people. What does that have to do with money? Um, well, I... Um, the the cameras. Um, yeah, when I go home tonight, I gotta cross this dangerous intersection, and there's old people and kids who gotta go to school, and there's guys who drive cars and they don't care, and they should be ticketed in time. And speed go too fast and drive recklessly. And are you gonna do anything to ensure that? They just had a big thing, all the kids going back to school. They called it safe routes to school. And it's, it's, and it's not very safe if there's cars going through red lights and speeding, is it? Um, well, my attitude is um, um, but then these guys, they hit all the bicyclists all the time, they don't care. Guys like him, yeah, they yeah. plow right through the bikes. They don't care. You know, they put some rules on giving yeah. bikes right away. Well, right. my attitude what are you going to do about these bike riders? Yeah, there's, there's a guy got hit right in front of the restaurant <laughs> on a bike. Are you going to do anything about this? I'm not clear as to what the problem is that needs to be resolved. More speeding cars that don't follow the traffic laws. Every hero look in both ways before crossing the street. My priority is proper education. I've said nothing about education so far, not to change the subject, but two most important things is uh, public safety and, um, and education. Um, they closed down about 50 schools. Um, I think those schools should remain um, schools. They should be safe havens for children to go to, maybe focusing on um, giving them a place that they can express themselves without any fear of reprisal. Because I think that that's the major issue now, whether it's sexual orientation or, um, you know, it's, it has to do, major human rights issue that I think young people are faced with is their own personal safety and their sense of safety to express themselves. And that's why, um, that's why they look the way they look in terms of hairstyles and everything else as a way of um, sometimes perhaps even unbeknownst to themselves I think um, you know, there was a uh, stoning to death of a woman in I think Afghanistan and I think that the reason that they gave was that she was looking at the picture of two women hugging which implies uh, she was stoned because she had a thought of, of being a lesbian uh, you have the, the sex police are out there and they're making all these judgments about people. As a practical matter, children need a safe place where they can express themselves. And I like the idea of those schools being safe havens where they focus on art, you know, uh, it could be hip hop music, creative writing, dancing, uh, you know, poetry, jam, slam, where they can really express themselves and be safe. And I think that that in of itself might be the most helpful thing for many of them. Abby? Yeah. Oh, Naya? Yes, you're up. 
How would you address the problem of the lack of jobs for kids coming out of high school? CVS, Chicago Vocational High School, I look at um, retrofitting existing American-made vehicles into hybrid electric and, and all-electric vehicles. You know, in Germany, when a high school student graduates, there is a job there for them. Is that correct? The jobs are in their country. My question is, 60,000... We have to insource a whole lot of jobs. We have to insource jobs, right? Do you have a, That's an right. idea of how to do that? What, how you would entice businesses to come back to Chicago? Um, that's a good question. Um, it has to be part of um, the energy, uh, green energy jobs initiative, which the um, prison industrial complexes have largely tapped into to the tune of, I think, half a trillion dollars a year. Is that correct? So that money should be earmarked for types of jobs that would um, retrofit existing Hummers and all the big gas guzzling American vehicles. And uh, those could be like assembly line type well-paying jobs that they could be trained for. And that's, that's, that's just for starters. Because the whole, uh, everything is, is connected. And so one has to have a comprehensive overview of everything and see how one thing builds on something else and how that affects other things. Mr. Uh, Paul. Uh, nothing Bolt's question. I believe the primary for mayor is in February? Uh, 2015. I think it's in February of 2015. 2015. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how many signatures do you said you need to get on the ballot? Probably 25,000. How far along are you? I, I need build out walls and his people to help me to do that. So how many have you got? Well, I um, was at Leroy Martin's funeral early today. It was um, He's a former police superintendent uh, uh, and a black guy. And uh, uh, I thought I would see build out walls there. I was hoping to introduce a kappa. And, um, but um, I feel like like build out walls will, will help me to to do that. We we need to talk and strategize about whose name is going to be on the ballot. See, here's my problem. Getting an answer from you is like trying to put a thumbtack in water. That's the question. All right, Charlie. Uh, I forgot what I was going to ask here. Um, all right, so. You're talking about, are you, are you going to have the city of Chicago, like, put up the factories and the city is going to own these factories? Well, I think there should be a moratorium on, 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 on the raising to the ground of any structurally sound building like, in Chicago, period. I think there needs to be a total stoppage to destruction of any structurally sound building. It can easily no, no, be renovated. No, you're talking to, about factories here to employ uh, kids. Are these going to be the uh, city of Chicago that's going to own factories and employees? I would have to consult with Bill Doc Walls as to the best way to do that. Because he, he would know better than I would. That's, that's about the best answer I can tell you. Jim Bolger. Who is Bill Doc Walls? He's my political mentor who is Harold Washington's primary protege who ran for mayor of Chicago in 2007 and 2011. He also ran for city clerk in 2003. Is he running again? Um, I don't know. I haven't seen or spoken to him in many, many months. And, and he and I need to, to, to talk and maybe strategize about having what they call a plebiscite in which, uh, you know, people decide who they want on the ballot, mayor or build up walls. What's the first thing you would do when assuming office as mayor? First order of business again is getting an inspector general. I don't know that uh, Joe Ferguson would do this, but I guess as mayor I get to choose his replacement who would quickly adjudicate Eugene Zor uh, Zorik Shackman case, um, which has profound implications. Can you tell us a little bit about that real quick? Yeah, the gist of it is, is that using the law legitimately uh, in uh, Eugene Zorg's hiring and firing case in Chicago, 
um, would make it public and that would generate discussion um, that would um, hold a lot of judges and other officers of the court um, accountable for um, for the truth of, of what they've been up to as relates to innocent people being railroaded to prison based on the lack of um, uh, exculpatory evidence which should be there as a matter of course in as much as all the um, courtroom proceedings are supposed to be recorded and the uh, people the litigants are supposed to have access easily to the recordings of their um, courtroom proceedings. Um, Governor Blagojevich didn't do anything illegal. He really shouldn't be in prison at all. Um, nobody will get out of prison soon. So you're talking about judicial reform as the first thing you'll do. How are you going to do the basics like keep the lights on, keep the roads paved, keep the citizens safe, uh, keep the parks maintained? Keep the road construction under control. Manage the budget. Do you have any plans for that at all? I think Bill Dot Walls um, is going to help me on that. He's supposed to. I think. Um, I think he may be more qualified to be mayor than I am. <laughs> actually, I don't have to be mayor of Chicago, but uh, but either Bill Dot Walls or myself should be on the ballot against the Ron Man. I'm just offering myself as a candidate. Uh, you know, there are other things I could be doing, but uh, uh, I feel like since I was always there for Bill Dot Bowles in 2007, that he should be here for me at least, so we can talk and decide which one of us is going to be on the ballot. Because for a black man in Chicago, running for mayor of Chicago is like a calling, and uh, he. Uh, and I need to sit down and, and talk privately, publicly, whichever one he would prefer, publicly, privately, to make any difference. Uh, do you have any immediate backers? Uh... Any immediate backers? Um, a number of people who said, um, when I said I was going to run for Mayor of Chicago, they said, I'll, I'll vote for you. Um, I, I can't think of any specific uh, individuals to name as immediate backers, people that might have a name that has some cachet associated with it. Uh, you know. Yes, uh, Mr. Cobb. Let's and bolts again. How big is your campaign uh, fund? How much money you got? Not I mean, like, <laughs> what, what happens is, is that uh, people uh, help me to distribute the petition and get signed and um, you know my name be on the ballot and they come out and vote for me. That, that's why I mentioned the uh, former U.S. Senator from I believe it was Wisconsin, either Bill Proxmire or another one. Was there a guy named Nelson um, in the... Uh, uh, yes, there's a Senator Nelson. Gaylord Nelson, I think it was. Yes. It was either Gaylord Nelson or Bill Proxmire. They spent very little money on the U.S. Senate campaign they won. It was 50 years ago. Yeah. Times are different. Yeah. Uh, yes. What is the, uh, the general deadline for you know uh, getting a procedure? You're just getting the campaign started right now. I take it. Um, what what are the, the deadlines you have to meet to you know to actually get on all, um, the, all the signatures together and get on the ballot? I don't you? know. I guess maybe sometime in November of. Uh, 2014, I guess I would be expected to uh, have the uh, the uh, petitions uh, in there so that they could uh, get my name on the ballot. Probably November 2014, I think. There is a petitioning period. I don't know why Bill Dot Walls is so conspicuously absent. It's like he should, be, he, he should be here with me. All right, <laughs> yes, Charles. Now, what do you plan to do about public transportation? Public transportation. Well, 
I want everyone who needs one of these uh, cards, ride free pass to, to have one, quite frankly. <coughs> I, I want people to be able to travel affordably, you know, and uh, that's one thing that I really respect about the government of the world because he enabled me to have a ride free pass. And um, I'm, I'm trying to make things easier for people, you know. People have so many things that they're burdened with. And being able to ride free, I mean, that's, that's something that I'm very keen on, on uh, enabling many, many people to have to be able to. So you eliminate the, the, the all the traffic there? No, no, the, the um, I think we should keep the, um, one-day pass should be uh, $5, a three-day pass should be $10, and a seven-day pass should be $20. Um, I know about the venture, and they said the venture is going to replace everything, so I, I, I think we should uh, maintain people's ability to have an affordable bus pass if they don't have a ride free pass, right? Uh, isn't, isn't there another way to pay for it besides it's a regressive tax on the poor person. The rich person pays the same as the poor person on the bus, right? Well, um, is that fair? There's a spiritual solution to the economic problem. And the one definition of spiritual is attitudinal. And a lot of things are the result of the attitudes that people show which have ways of regulating the economic um, fortunes of the people. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, Mr. Tom. Uh, a parochial question from my, my viewpoint, my community. Uh, Chinese kids generally don't speak English until they enter first grade in public school. Mm -hmm. What would you do about Bilingual education for Chinese kids in Chinatown. Bilingual education for Chinese children in, in Chinatown. Um, well, homeschooling is legal, and so in the spirit of homeschooling, I, I would expect that every um, person in, in the city um, learn basic English. You know. They're kids. They're six years old, mm -hmm. and they come into the public schools not speaking English. What right. are you talking about? And homeschooling? The parents don't speak English. Come on. Well, I what respect. You, what's, I, your, what's your suggestion here? Well, um, uh, you know, I, I again, I, I just think that every. Every child needs to learn how to speak English because America is an English-speaking country. Right. So how do we get them country. to that point? Take well, them away from their parents. That's one solution. Yeah. <laughs> um, Put them in camps. <laughs> uh, well, I think that Chinese children that speak only Chinese can, can learn English by um, associating with children who speak English and maybe they can kind of learn basic English, I guess. In other words, you're going to do nothing. <laughs> Just encourage um, people to, uh, to learn English. I think that the um, universal language really should be English as a practical matter because you have airlines, you know, you have an airline pilot flying into a non English speaking country. If everyone spoke English, then we would be able to uh, avoid the plane crash. They already do. English, English is a universal language for air traffic control. Let's go to rebuttals. Yeah. Uh, how many are for going to rebuttals? All right, we'll do it. Uh, and uh, David Travis uh, will be All right, let's thank you. Thank you. Uh,
Listen, I uh, don't want to give anyone a heart attack or anything, but I absolutely am going to agree with uh, Charlie Paydock tonight. <laughs> that, uh, oh, no. uh, oh, yes, that traffic laws should be obeyed. I absolutely agree with that. And in fact, I wrote a little note here to myself in which I said that uh, traffic laws should be obeyed but we don't need to shove cameras up their asses and steal away their privacy in order to have traffic laws obeyed. Mr. Paydock would like the traffic laws obeyed. I think the traffic laws should be obeyed, but I don't think we need speed cameras and uh, photo enforcement cameras in order to do it. We did a pretty good job of it over the years without those. And so let's ask the question, do we really want to have the, uh, there are those here who I must ask, do they really want the traffic laws okay? Or do they just want to use that as an opportunity to foist uh, more and more uh, statism down people's throats to, to bring about greater and greater control by the authorities and thus um, fostering more and more communism and socialism. Uh, the, the, I mean, let's, let's deal with the issue, you know, let's not use one thing in order to achieve our uh, agendas. Uh, I want to say that if Andrew Nelson were a wino, he would be more suited to be mayor than Rahm Emanuel. And I will issue a pointer to Mr. Nelson. All you need to do to be a good mayor is don't do what Richard M. Daly or Rahm Emanuel have done. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, before we proceed any further, uh, we should have some some little uh, limit on how long people should speak. No, no. Otherwise, we got we got plenty of time tonight, so yeah, plenty of time, sir. I think so too. All right, it's roughly. I'm going next. All right. <coughs> I will watch you. Jimbo. So you want to run for mayor of the city of Chicago? Well, the first thing I would do if I was running for mayor of the city of Chicago is get a platform. What are you for? What are you against? How are you going to keep things going in the proper way? For example, if I was going to run for mayor of the city of Chicago, first of all, I wouldn't be qualified to run for mayor of the city of Chicago, and I would have a platform and a passion to do so. Since I don't, I'm not running. You need some demonstrated executive ability. You need to at least run a couple of organizations or something before you do. Have a little bit of experience. You're talking about running something the equivalent of a major corporation with many department heads, many meetings, many things like this. You need certain executive ability to do this. And I did not see that tonight with you. Now I understand you may have a, a liking for it, but at a small venue like this you were having trouble even answering some of the simpler questions, you know, like how much money do you have? How many signatures do you have accomplished? Uh, basic systems to streets and sanitation. I didn't hear any of it tonight, and if it was a choice between you and Rahm Emanuel, I'd pick Rahm Emanuel immediately because he's got the ability and he's already been chief of staff of the White House. And frankly, you know, whether you ha agree or disagree with the mayor on some other things, you know, there is a city council, there is aldermen, there's a ton of ways to get things done, and you're dealing with a large, large budget. Whether you like or dislike the speed cameras, that's one thing. But there is a whole law enforcement thing. And the funny thing is, the first thing you say what you do as your mayor is that you reform the judicial system when basically there's still a lot of people in the city of Chicago that 
you know, are having trouble with parking and having trouble with basic water connections or having trouble with sewer lines getting fixed, having trouble with the streets getting repaired. I mean, the first and foremost, anything that any mayor should do is keep the streets clean, keep the, keep the infrastructure repaired, and make sure that people have basic services into the city. That's something I heard nothing of tonight. Now, I happen to know somebody right now who's running for the clerk of the Circuit Court of McHenry County. His qualification for the office is he's worked in that office for the last 25 to 30 years. And he wants to keep, and his main campaign platform is it's not broke, we don't need to fix it, we need to keep it running as is and keep it working properly. I'm that candidate who can help keep it run properly and help modernize it better by implementing an information system into that clerk's office. We have one already, but it's antiquated. I plan on doing this, 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 and this to get the office running better so we can service the needs of McHenry County property owners better and keep our county records up to date, up to snuff, and in place. And he's qualified because he's worked there. He knows what he's doing with it. He's worked with the, with the, with the person who has been there for a number of years, and he's a recommended candidate for it. That is somebody I would vote for, not his opponent who's had no experience in the clerk's office, somebody who's coming in and saying he's gonna make all these radical changes with no experience whatsoever. That to me is something else. It's much akin to what the Tea Party has been doing in Washington, D.C. They come in with this goofy agenda of low taxes, low taxes, low government, low government, and what are we getting? Sequester. We're getting a lot of different things like this. They want everything that the government does for business, but they don't want to pay for a damn thing. Likewise, all the liberals in there want the government to do so much for them, and still, they don't want to pay for anything else. Government is ran by people, qualified people, that we must vote for. And if we vote unqualified people in, we'll get a government mess that has unqualified people running for it. If we look at the candidates, exercise our vote properly, I think we, that's where the fundamental part of democracy arises. No, I'm not running for mayor of the city of Chicago. No, I'm not running for any political office. Do I have any aspirations? No. One of the main reasons is this is forum. There'd be, a, I got well over 300 hours up and uh, anybody be well open to attack me on anything by misquoting me on a number of these rebuttals. So with that, Yes, I do believe there is a causal link between nicotine and lung cancer. Yes, I do believe the world is not flat. Yes, I do believe in science and technology and running for stuff. And yes, I am rambling at this point, so I'm off the stage. Thanks. Thank you, Tim uh, Get up there, Charlie. Yes, sometimes uh, our speakers are uh, poorly prepared, and I think that our candidate tonight, uh, Andrew Nelson, was uh, poorly prepared uh, not only for the office he's uh, seeking, but for a presentation of himself as a candidate, and I, I my vague memory of his last appearance uh, was that he was better prepared then. I don't know what, why uh, he refers so often to Doc Wallace, uh, who uh, Bill Wallace uh, has spoken to us, and he at least had a sense of the, the of the politics of, of Chicago. Uh, a presentation read to us uh, from uh, supporters uh, uh, and believers in Baha'u'llah, uh, the uh, Baha'i uh, prophet uh, who uh, came and Oh, what was it, 1830? He was born in 1817. Yeah, well, he, 
he uh, became a prophet uh, in, uh, I guess, First the 1830s. Well, <laughs> uh, whatever. Uh, but we, unfortunately, uh, and uh, I, I suppose unfortunately, <laughs> have very little knowledge of, of what rules, uh, of what uh, a world order uh, he advocated. He did uh, believe that there were a number of prophetic religions uh, that uh, were expressing uh, uh, divine law uh, and uh, wanted uh, harmony amongst them. Uh, uh, he made an effort in that uh, regard and uh, uh, there was much to commend him for in that. Uh, but uh, certainly it is not exactly a uh, proposal for uh, Chicago's uh, good order uh, to refer us to Baha'u'llah uh, until uh, you uh, explain what Baha'u'llah would do for city government. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, right. Charlie is next. All right, thank you. All right, uh, again, let's thank our speaker. He's, uh, again, in putting in his campaign, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Well, there's one thing about running for political office. And are you familiar, my friend here, with the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And we hear of so many candidates that tell us they're going to transform the community or the office or the department, uh, whatever the community in the Big Rock Candy Mountain. And they're just giving us something that was scripted by a staff member, read to us in advance. Um, you know, I, I must commend Mr. Nelson here. He, he made no campaign promises here, <laughs> which um, fulfill, you know, puts an obligation on fulfillment. But certainly your platform has to have a little more body or substance to it. Actually, one of the things about this is um, a lot of the uh, people running for political office will not fill out questionnaires uh, for some of the rating systems, such as the IVI, uh, the uh, Vote Smart thing, because they have to make a commitment in writing as to what they're going to commit themselves to do. As a matter of fact, it's caused a problem, like for Vote Smart, that virtually no one is, is fulfilling the uh, campaign questionnaires as to what their positions are on any of the issues. So in terms of us voting for knowledgeable, so like you're looking for knowledge of candidates, believe you me that even among the political communities, they're saying do not fill these out. Something like even our CTA group sends out a questionnaire, what do you plan to do and things of that nature on public transit. And there is a boycott among, in the political community, among the pros, not to commit yourself to anything, anywhere, uh, in this regard. And I think it's an endemic, what do you call it, a systemic problem in our political structure. We're, you are voting for, you may get a few words in here and things of that nature. I think one thing you gotta look at is it, C-SPAN, they have a big campaign going on uh, for mayor of New York City, which is rather intriguing because they have seven candidates of widely disparate backgrounds. And if you see some any of their debates, you get a real idea of what's going on in the political community. 
Uh, some relying on just good naturedness, and you know, some are, are like you're saying, practical administrators and things of that nature. Uh, but there is a thing, it's largely the candidate remains unknown. That's why they don't put up websites. If you think with the internet, you would think campaigning for an incumbents do. But, or no, no, I got it just the opposite. The incumbents will not. It's relatively surprising. You will not find a website for someone running for Congress, the United States Congress, very rarely. And if you do, it's going to be one page, and it's going to be for to collect money. Now, you will find if they're in office sometimes. If they are serving in office, they may have some websites with their positions up there. But normally, an incumbent, there's no, I actually was going to put together a website where you could look up all the candidates. And I was amazed at virtually no one from the Illinois delegation had a website or anything regarding their positions or views on anything. The only thing you can conceivably rely on to know about a candidate are the rating services, uh, such as the unions, the FLCIO, uh, the, the, I belong to the United Nations group, how they vote on international affairs. There's about, I think, 80 of these total, somewhere between 80 and 100. Uh, Sierra Club, things of that nature. Illinois Environmental, I just got one of the best legislators in Illinois in which they pick particular pieces of legislation and give the ranking to them. They're at best a vague thing, but a pretty good indication about the only thing we have to rely on, I'll be honest with you, in terms of being an educated, informed voter. I even have subscribed to a computer service where I can combine or customize my own way of reviewing their votes on issues, extending over several congresses to see, ascertain how they are voting. And it's a small cost attendant to this, but I can custom design it, uh, but particularly where, on issues that I'm concerned with and customize to do the research. But that's about the only real solid, accurate information that you will have on what you're voting for. Believe you me. You get scripted stuff and things of this nature, and they're not really going to commit themselves anywhere on some of the substantive issues. <coughs> now, regarding speed cameras and traffic light cameras, I'm sorry, you've got some notion here that driving an automobile is the private activity. It's a public activity. You're on a public highway. Uh, the public highway and these streets and sidewalks are occupied by everyone in the community. If you want privacy, then stay home. But once you venture out in the public, it's, believe you me, even legally, once you put your name out there, you're in the public domain, there's no expectation of privacy. I believe you, believe you me, I have had cases like this because of my own name being in publications. And there's no privacy concerns whatsoever when it comes, and I'll tell you this much, there's the one thing that's an inherent function of government, and that's public safety. And if the city, the state and the federal government can ensure our public safety, they have failed us. Now, if I cannot cross a street, if I cannot go up and down across the street safely, I don't know how there's any right that is superior to that, that says I, you can endanger the lives of senior citizens, children, and the public. You do not have a right to endanger the lives of anyone. Now, the other thing about automobiles, how fast do you think an automobile has to be traveling to hit you that you would survive? What, how fast? You say five miles an hour, 10, 40, 50? I'll tell you this, five miles per hour. Anything over five miles per hour 
if your your chances of survival are not good, if at all. You have no margin whatsoever. It, it is exceptionally dangerous. So this is a serious issue. Uh, and if it costs you money, don't break the law. Listen, it's very clear. There's rules of the road. It's not complex. It's a little tiny book. Huh. If you can't learn those, and if you don't want to obey them, and then you don't get a vehicle with thousands of pounds of power, don't you get in control of that? Unless you know these are the rules. It's like the rules of college. If you don't want to follow the rules, hey, that's your problem. These are the rules of operating transportation in a community in a responsible fashion. If you don't want to do it, walk. Do without it. You have no right to drive a car in the state of Illinois. That's why they can take away your license. And they do it every day because people think, and believe you me, I still remember going, I had, a, for some reason, I got a traffic ticket, a parking ticket on a car that I had jumped. But I went to the traffic court and I still remember the judge said, he says, does anybody here think that they don't have to obey the traffic laws of the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois? And one guy raised his hand. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, listen, you stand over there. The rest of you, the case is dismissed, get out. No, everyone has to obey the laws, and it's very important. It's not just a good idea. It's our public safety here, and you have to drive responsibility. And maybe I think it's time we got some of the, rid of some of the irresponsible people off our highways and things of that nature. I just heard about some things about some traffic accidents in public transit that were caused by nothing but idiot, like idiot drivers. This was the case. The bus pulls up and passengers are getting out and off, so they pull around to the right in front of it, right? Like, they think that bus is, what, parked permanently? It never gets up and goes? So they pull right, right and turn, and, and I see it all the time. Every time I get on the bus, somebody does this. That, are there that many people who don't know how to operate a car? You pull a right-hand turn in front of a bus. You have no idea whether it's going to start accelerating or moving, but it, it, it's not permanently fixed there on the street to do that under any circumstances. But that bus is pulling out, and they do it, and they all know them in. Hey, yeah, thanks a lot. Gave me a chance to talk here a little bit. Thank you very much. And I like that idea about the city of Chicago establishing factories. I was just reading about um, the countries of the world where the railroads have been nationalized. I think there's about a dozen countries where the country, the country came in and completely took over the railroad network. And I think I might run for Congress on that platform. All right, thank you. We got an open mic. Let's get up there. Andy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Mr. Nelson, uh, I'm very disappointed in what I've heard today. But I will say one thing in your favor. You don't have an ounce of arrogance. There's something to be said for that. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think you have an ounce of competence either. Um, like I said, I, I pose questions, nuts and bolts of questions. You evade every one of them. You evaded every one of them. Trying to get an answer from you is like trying to put a thumbtack in the water. <laughs> Trying to drive a nail into a pile of jello. I mean, I'm sorry, it, you're just too mushy for me. Uh, and that question about Chinese kids in Chinatown, um, that was disingenuous. That was really a dishonest question, and I did it on purpose just to see you tap dance on a frying pan. Because I said, so in other words, you're going to do nothing. Well, actually, that's the right answer. You don't have to do anything. Chinese kids speaking no English, entering into the first grade in John C. Haynes School in Chinatown, Take to English like ducks to water. I know I didn't speak English till I was six years old until I entered first grade in John C. Haynes School in Chinatown. And I ended up an English major with a degree in journalism from Medill at Northwestern. 
and I won awards in advertising. I had a 10-year career in broadcasting. So, not bad for a kid who didn't speak English at age six. It was, a, it was a bullshit question. And I did it on purpose just to see what you would say. And you tap dance like everything else. Uh, and sir, I would just say, you can't tap dance your way to the mayoral ship. And I think you're wasting your time. That's the constructive thing I have to say. And I'm gonna violate the rules of the college in just this one instance, but I'll do it as politely as I can. I'm gonna attack you personally. I think you're a flake. Go home, don't be mayor. Don't waste your time, don't waste hours. But you're not arrogant, thank you. Still an open mic, let's keep going. Andy? Well, um, I think uh, our speaker has captured the essence of uh, what a lot of people are feeling around the world. Uh, that things aren't going well in certain areas. Um, anybody that's studying what's happening in the United States, if they've lived here, if they've grown up and considered the United States their country, uh, you know, we're constantly being told, well, if you don't like it, uh, leave the country. Well, no, um, I'm an American. I'm also a veteran. This is my country. I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted with the criminals that are running the country, and I would like to see some way to get them out of office. Um, the, I feel like the most constructive thing I can do is help people learn uh, shorten their learning time, in other words. The average person does not have time to read 15 or 20 books a week. So my brother and I digest those books over a period of time, like these two I mentioned here tonight. I'll mention them again for the camera. Uh, Charles Ferguson wrote this book called Predator Nation, and it describes the billionaire predators, category by category, who have taken over the government of the United States. And it's full of suggestions about what ordinary people can do at all levels to try to uh, take back the country. Uh, you know, we, we, some of us are old enough to remember a time when if you graduated from high school and you got a, you were willing to work hard, you could go apply for a job in many different places and support yourself. If you were willing to work hard a 40 hour week, uh, you could support yourself. That is no longer the case today. Uh, McDonald's, if, for those of you that haven't done a Google search yet or looked it up, McDonald's Corporation published a, uh, a sample budget uh, to help their workers budget their money and their time so that they could uh, live effectively. And uh, the McDonald's budget starts with the core idea that you're working two jobs, an 80 hour week full time at minimum wage. And they said, uh, you know, uh, you should budget at least $20 a month for health care. Um, the, the idea, the idea that you can get a job and work hard and support yourself has been replaced in America over the last 33 years. This book describes it. It's called What Went Wrong When We Voted in Ronald Reagan and the concept of Reaganomics was spread up and down the breadth of this land, Charles, uh, sorry, it's George R. Tyler that wrote this book, What Went Wrong in America. He describes it chapter and verse, starting in with 1973 was the peak year. Uh, a bunch of rich billionaires got together and said, uh, we don't need to keep paying people a higher wage because there's an excess of workers. We can move plants out to other countries. So. 1973 was the peak year for the American middle class. It's been in decline a little bit ever since. Today, uh, McDonald's is famous now. If you uh, saw the articles on the internet and a bunch of other places, uh, McDonald's and Walmart, especially McDonald's, uh, they pay $16, $17 an hour as a minimum wage in the McDonald's places in places like Australia, France. America is the only industrial country, modern country that I'm aware of, 
that allows corporations to say, we can't people pay our people anything but a homeless shelter wage because we go out of business. If the labor costs were higher, we, we just couldn't function. We did. We checked down. Well, it's a big lie. Among uh, Some of you have seen me give speeches here in, in the past over uh, the top 25 blacked out subjects each year. Uh, a paperback book about this size comes out of Sonoma State University. Uh, it's an award-winning journalism program that's been up and running for 30 years. It's called, uh, the book would be Censored. It's say Censored 2013, Censored 2012. The Censored 2014 edition is coming out in November. It comes out about November every year. It, uh, it's a journalism project that uh, funnels stories from about 500 different stories around the country. They call it down to the top 25 most explosive blacked out stories that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. And the book specifically, uh, Sonoma State University counsels journalism students in how not to get fired and blackballed if you're going to be a journalist in America. Christina Borgesson. Is anybody here familiar with that name, uh, journalist? Christina Borgesson wrote a book called Into the Buzzsaw, published it in 2004, nine years ago. She collected the stories of 18 Pulitzer Prize winning journalists that had all been fired and blackballed one day, came out of the blue. They didn't know they were working on a taboo radioactive story. And uh, for, for their efforts of trying to write a story to get it to the public, and sometimes it was published, sometimes it wasn't, their career just ended. They were fired, blackballed, it was over. So uh, better, than any, better than anybody else in the entire country that <clears throat> describes how the American media shapes and molds public opinion and keeps Americans in a bubble of mythology compared to people that are living outside the bounds of America. People in other countries are much better educated about what's happening in America than we actually are in America. So um, I can understand uh, our speaker you know, uh, approaching it from the uh, viewpoint of religious tenets uh, that you know, stem from something uh, people call the golden rule. It's translated into many different languages. Um, there's something called the Jubilee in the Bible, uh, where they forgive debts every 50 years. Am I correct on that? Uh, you know, various different religions around the world have the concept of not making huge amounts of interest profits off of people uh, when you loan money. Um, America is the only modern country in the world where you can run hospitals like this. If you try to run for-profit hospitals in Europe, the police just come out and arrest you. It's illegal to make massive profits off sick people like it, like we do it in America. There's, we have 5% of the world's people. The other 95% uh, scattered through countries all over the world are showing us the way of what a uh, compassionate modern society looks like if you address you address the problem of your corporate predators. You don't let predators rise to the top and just eat everything in sight, pollute everything in sight, kill people. And, well, like, you know, the, the drug companies, their attitude is, well, we have a great new uh, heart medicine that uh, will lower, you know, uh, make, make your heart beat more stable or whatever if you have problems. It'll kill one out of 200 people that take it. But, but the other 199 uh, will benefit and will get good benefits. So one death out of every 200 is not bad for something that will uh, you know, make us a bundle of profits. That's the essence of the American drug industry right now. And uh, Mike Papantonio, on, uh, for those of you that don't know, he a, a, runs a law firm in Florida that uh, sues people, uh, for, sues for uh, workers' rights. And he says that he, he, he uh, instructs all of his clients, friends, everybody, he says, don't take any new drug that comes on the market in America these days. Wait for it to be on, on you know, use only stuff that, if you can, things that have been out there for five or ten years. Ten years should be, you know, the, the benchmark. If something hasn't been around for at least eight or ten years, you can bet that uh, it hasn't been fully vetted for side effects. And they're, they're constantly putting new things on the market. But, you know, people are dying. You know, you know, 
50, 100,000 a year or more uh, die from adverse drug effects in America. They, they're not having these problems in Europe and other countries. There's all kinds of beneficial things that can be done. But for the sense I'm getting for the last two, three years, the books that I've seen, the authors are all basically saying the same thing now from different points of view. It said, uh, progress comes from the ground up. We cannot wait for our politicians to, uh, you know, give us a beneficial solution from the top down. The Europeans show it when they, you know, if a politician talks about cutting their health care or retirement funds, people just walk out the door and shut the country down. They don't have two or three dozen people pro promoting, they have millions in the streets in one day in many other countries because they said, you know, it's up to us. In a democracy, it's up to us. So, um, I can, I can appreciate the, the, the comments of other people in the audience tonight. I, I think our speaker uh, was not fully prepared to kick off the campaign, and uh, he might consider rethinking. Uh, but I think he's coming from a sense that things are bad in Chicago. We got predators uh, running some of our offices. We got a parking meter problem that just and for the company that owns it, it's like printing money. And these red light cameras are, uh, you know, I'm not talking about the safety cameras, Charlie. I'm talking about the rolling tire cameras. Your tires roll over one of those sensors in the road going uh, three, you know, a half a mile an hour and click, it takes a ticket and gives you $100. These are revenue enhancement uh, cameras that should be differentiated from the safety cameras. I, I think if they enforce the safety cameras like Charlie was talking about, enforce laws, they would make enough money off of fines that they didn't have to trap people making right turns on red when there's nobody around, no cars, no people. You roll over the sensor, you know, you can't even see any cars. It could be the middle of the night. You wherever that wire is buried in the ground, you roll over without stopping eight inches before at a complete stop and it will sense that your car was moving and click camera just takes a click of your license plate. In basketball, they have a term. It's called no harm, no foul. There's contact all the time. If they were calling all the fouls, anytime you touch somebody, the games would come to a standstill. Well, I think, you know, the correct term for these cameras is no harm, no foul, give me a hundred. That's what they're doing. No harm, no foul. You didn't violate any laws. You stopped, but your tires are just rolling a little bit there. You roll. You didn't come to a complete stop. And if there's snow on the ground, you don't know. You you can you, if you stop too far back of the line, you get a camera, uh, you get a ticket. I got one of those. You have you have to be in a sweet spot, and when there's snow on the ground, you have no idea where the sweet spot is. And the only reason we don't have cameras charging us for the privilege of breathing, you know, walking while breathing. Well, you didn't breathe properly. Give me a hundred. They haven't figured out how to do that yet. But it's coming if we don't do something about the predators that are looking to extract billions off of ordinary, everyday human activity. So, you know, we we need improvement from the bottom up. I I fully I can appreciate and applaud the efforts of anybody that's trying to run for any office, you know, to just add their voice to trying to help people make a beneficial difference, a beneficial improvement. When, look at how long it took us to have smoke-free restaurants. Now we don't, you can't have a good debate on that issue anymore. You can't have a debate on whether the earth is flat or round. You can't have a debate on whether inhaling asbestos dust is a health hazard. These things have all been proven facts. Well, as society moves forward that way in the direction of truth. And on a lot of the issues we were, we're talking about here tonight, things will get better when enough people reach the breaking point, critical mass, and just say, that's unacceptable. We won't accept it anymore. And that, that's what needs to be done. And it starts with journalists helping people learn what's really going on and what's being blacked out by the news. I've, uh, you've heard me say it before, I don't know. If I live long enough for time travel to become possible in my lifetime, if it becomes affordable, the first place I'm going is back to find George Orwell and shake his hand and say, our media has exceeded your wildest expectations. That's it. Thank you.
second round, huh? Yeah, well, it's, it was this cat's up here, no, no hurt, no harm. What was that? What was that? No harm, no foul. No harm, no foul. Traffic court. Sir, did you come to a stop? Yes. Then there's no ticket. You're, you're talking about rolling through no, a stop I, I sign? Stop two feet back of the line. Did you did you follow the traffic laws? Yeah. I got a ticket anyway. It was in the right turn lane. It's revenue enhancement. What did you get the ticket for doing? They said I was uh, the car ahead of me wasn't totally out of the intersection. They said I was drafting. I was 15 feet behind the other car. But said you can't draft behind another car. It's simple. It says stop and just stop. I did. White lines. Did. Then why do you get a you don't well, get tickets? You're talking about the Missouri roll around the, an intersection. No, you haven't been out in the suburbs lately. You got to go out. Yeah, the Charlie. It just says stop. I don't see what's complicated. Stop. Line. Stop. Go. There's Nobody nothing. gets any it tickets. It makes a ticket where it makes a difference where well, you stop. That's what I'm telling you. You stop too no far back in the line. You stop and then go around. It's right turn on red. If you're not close enough to the line, the sensor doesn't sensor the triggers are wrong. And they, they put those sensors all different places. They're revenue out there. I'm telling you, it's revenue. That's and exactly correct. Right, right turn on Especially red. since they said it's a violation of a local ordinance. Yeah. You and they don't go. You don't get trapped if you're still going. No one gets trapped who goes below the speed limit. No Wait until you start below. driving, Charlie, and get your first red light yeah. ticket. Then you'll have. No, it sounds like you. You want? I'm going to be changing my persona. And go. You know, I don't understand this. I can question. You want to hear a good story? He told me the thing that the example you gave me was that you committed, you hit somebody. And he said, no harm, no foul. You, you did something, you no, hit no, somebody. No, I, I didn't say that at all. Charlie. So I'm going, you don't hit anybody. No, no you If don't. you can't have a contact, you, you're not supposed to have contact. Go on with your speech, Charlie. Go on with you know, your speech. But I don't know. This, I've got my basic premises. Rules of the road are there. Follow them. If you don't, don't turn the key on, you know. Don't believe in these things, you know. Uh, I mean, it's dangerous out there. And then with these cell phones, no one's paying attention. I don't feel sorry for you guys. I'm sorry. I really don't. I have to even a few of those tickets. Stop where you're supposed to stop. I do. There is a reason for that. And then proceed, look, and you don't have any problems. You know, I, I think if you follow the procedures, there'll be no problems. That's a simple thing. You're digressing from it. Topping down the block? Or something. What, is, what is he talking about here? Anyhow, running for office. I'm going to give you a little hint here. Uh, every election time, a lot of candidates come to the independent voters of Illinois and they want our endorsement. Because yeah. it looks real good on their uh, campaign literature. And they talk about it, independent voters of Illinois, and we do review the credentials of candidates. However, one thing you may not be aware of this is that when we call up the name of a candidate among the officers, the very first thing we ask about the candidate, the very first question is, is this a viable campaign? <laughs> And what do you mean by that? You like you were hitting on. Do you have money? Do you have a structure? Do you have a campaign office? Do you have phones? Do you have literature? Basically, have you gotten on the ballot and things like that? Now, getting on the ballot these days, I was at a meeting today, the people don't want to have a third party which is virtually impossible. Now this is, this is nothing to do with issues. But you, in order to put together a viable campaign, I don't care if it's a little tiny one, you need a considerable amount of money. That's the basic threshold. And you can be like a third party and say, we're not taking corporate money, but it's gonna be very, very difficult. Uh, even 
simple little congressional campaigns. Basic price tag used to be a quarter of a million bucks, just to just to be considered basic campaign. You know, this is not without any issues. This is just candidate, generic candidate. You've got to put together. Now I was looking here at the literature that I had here from the Greens, their new brochure. In order to get on a ballot, you need, in the state of Illinois, 45,000 signatures if you want to run a presidential candidate, 5,000 signatures if you want to run for Congress, and 1,500 signatures for state representative. And you're going to need to probably about double that number because your, your signatures are going to get crossed off and idiots and you know, people are just scramble and they're not voters and things of that nature. That's not easy to do. Believe you me, 45,000 signatures, you, you need paid people to do this. It's, it be, be, I, the Greens have done it through volunteers. And I found, we got 60,000 signatures. And I found that an incredible, remarkable achievement for which they should be given full credit. They did it entirely among volunteers, and that's insurmountable effort. Leave you me if you've ever, and you've got to do this very often in winter. Actually, I found something. I found my photo on the on the internet collecting signatures for Ron Emanuel, as a matter of fact. <laughs> But I was just happened to be at their campaign headquarters. But yes, you, often in the middle of winter, you have a very restricted time frame. And it, unless you have an army of volunteers, it's virtually next to impossible. Um, it's, there's, a, there's, a, they make it, believe you me, it's easy today than it used to be in Illinois. In Illinois, it used to be next to impossible. This is easy. This is after they've made it easy. So running a campaign, just the logistics of it and things of that nature are, are, are against you. If you can get it, you haven't, won, you haven't begun campaigning yet. Just, just the threshold, the initial threshold of this. And I, if anything, we need some campaign reform in that regard. They're just making it, they're excluding too many people from the process. On this, this is silly signatures kind of stuff, you know. But anyhow, thanks a lot. All right. Speaker gets the final word. Speaker gets the final word. It's important to recognize that no scheme which the calculations of the highest statesmanship may yet devise, no doctrine which the most distinguished exponents of economic theory may hope to advance. No principle which the most ardent of moralists may strive to inculcate can provide, in the last resort, adequate foundations upon which the future of a distracted world can be built. That no appeal for mutual tolerance which the worldly wise might raise, however compelling and insistent, can calm its passions or help to restore its vigor. Nor that any general scheme of mere organized international cooperation, whatever sphere of human activity, however ingenious in conception or extensive in scope, succeed in removing the root cause of the evil that has so rudely upset the equilibrium of present-day society. But even I venture to assert that the very active devising the machinery required for the economic and political unification of the world provide within itself the antidote against the poison that is steadily undermining the vigor of organized peoples and nations. What else might we not confidently affirm than the un... Uh, the un... Abashed. I'm trying to think of the, act, of the exact word. I want to quote it verbatim. The um, ah. unsolicited. Uh, well, uh, anyway, that's from the World Order Baha'u'llah, Chapter Two: uh, the, the Impotence of Statesmanship, uh, the Goal of a New World Order. My whole orientation is that of a Baha'i, a true Baha'i. And my words testify and are suggestive of that fact. 
And bearing that in mind and testifying of that fact should clearly indicate what my goals and objectives are. In faith of God, we say that the emphasis is on effort rather than on achievement. That's why my whole attitude in uh, making an effort to be mayor of Chicago uh, is the way that it is, because the whole system is to be markedly different in a higher and better way. And so it's important that we relinquish some of these um, antiquated, anachronistic uh, thought patterns and belief systems that we have as to how I'm somehow to run for mayor of Chicago. You know? Um, the whole system is to, to be different. This is to be the Baha'i system. And the whole Baha'i system is based on the writings of the faith of God. And that has to be taken into consideration when it comes to how I'm somehow supposed to be conducting this campaign. That's my whole point. Okay, let's... I have a quick question. Uh, do you anticipate having any problem? Would have people ask you anything about the, the concept of the separation between church and state? Exactly. The um, memo that was written to the Danbury Baptist Association circa 1802, private memo of uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, nowhere in the U.S. Constitution will you find the phrase separation of church and state. This country was based on uh, Christians and some Jews. The Judeo-Christian ethic is the basis of American governance. And um, that needs to be respected. Okay, let's call it a night. He never does. So thank you all very much. Mass media. Mass media.